Hello, Parasites. This is Ben Pronsky. I'm the voice of Eddie Brock and Venom in Marvel Spider-Man Maximum Venom. And you're watching the Venom Vlog. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. Finally, I know, I uh, took the whole week off to kind of catch up on other things, and I'm also preparing some more interviews for you guys, which is very exciting. I'm going to have more interviews uh, for, you know, the Maximum Venom cartoon series, and that's what we're here to talk about today, because I finally watched the second episode, so I didn't have the ability to watch it. I was using the Disney Now app to watch the first episode, and then the second episode was like, hey, you have to, you know, sign up with your uh, local provider, you know, internet provider and cable provider, and I was like, okay, so I connected my accounts, and they go, uh, well, you don't have cable, and I'm like, yeah, I, I don't pay for cable, like, I, I don't, I just watch YouTube and Twitch, so I don't really watch TV or anything, and, uh, and then they're like, oh, okay, well, then you can't watch this episode, <laughs> so I was like, oh, great, uh, so I uninstalled the app and reinstalled it, tried it a couple times, it didn't really work, and, uh, and I was like, yeah, that's fine, it'll pop up somewhere. Uh, but then someone told me it was going to be on uh, on Hulu as well, so I signed up for Hulu, but then I ended up watching it anyway, you know, before I got the Hulu version, so next time now I can watch, you know, who I have Hulu from now on, because I think they had some kind of deal with Hulu and Disney Plus and everything, so I was like, well, I already had Disney Plus once, I canceled it, I was like, alright, I'll go back to it so I can get Hulu and have access to it and watch these episodes when they pop up. Now I think the next episode, episode 3, is going to be June 21st, which is Sunday, uh, and a couple Sundays from now, not this Sunday, but a couple Sundays from now, like a month away. And, uh, and that'll be the third episode. And we'll talk more about that. But I do have some interviews coming up with Kevin Burke and Doc Wyatt that you're going to have here on the show right before the third episode airs. Uh, kind of like not a countdown. I don't know if I'll be able to get them for three interviews, but we'll do one cool interview with the both of them. And we'll talk about kind of like their previous work, the, their work on Transformer stuff that they do. And then definitely the stuff they're doing on Maximum Venom. That'll be the focus of the interview. So I'll have that for you guys closer to the third episode airing. And then after the third episode airs, uh, Chris, uh, Doc Wyatt, you know, he's he's been really supportive of the show, him and Kevin, and they write Maximum Venom, and they were like, hey, you know, we also may be able to help you get a couple other interviews, and one of them which is a really big deal to me, but I don't want to, like, jinx myself, so I'll wait until we lock everything in and we get that going, and then, you know, once I feel comfortable announcing it and once we have the episode recorded and in the bag, then I'll feel better and I'll tell you who we're interviewing, but they're going to be uh, a comic book legend and who is also working on the Maximum Venom cartoon, writing one of the upcoming episodes. Uh, so I'm very excited. And as we know, Moon Knight is going to appear in the next episode too. I'm excited to see Mark Spector brought to life on screen in animated form. So this is going to be fun. A lot of cool content coming up. And uh, in this episode, like I said, we're going to finally review episode two of Maximum Venom. Uh, and uh, and I'm sorry for the week off. You know, I just kind of needed it. And I did uh, stream on my gaming channel. So if you ever want to just hang out with me, sometimes when you don't see me here, I'm probably over there just, you know, gaming on my YouTube channel. And we played God of War last week. And I loved it. It was my first time playing through it, and I loved it so much. So you'll probably see some other God of War content coming up on that channel as well. Because now I'm like it's totally sucked into that universe. It's so awesome. Uh, so for this episode, though, uh, all that aside, thanks for uh, supporting those Ben Pronsky interviews, by the way, for Maximum Venom. I had an intro here from Ben. He was nice enough to send one over. So thank you again, Ben, for not only being on the show, but doing it three times, which is more than I could have ever asked for. And I hope all of you guys really enjoyed that content. And obviously, the more interactions we get, the more views we get on those episodes, the likelihood of me getting more you know, interviews happens. And I want to bring that kind of content to you guys like you know I don't want to you know it's, it's mostly just me sitting here talking to you guys uh, but uh, we've been doing that for 500 plus episodes now so any chance I can get to get other people to come on here and talk Venom I will and now that I have the system where I can record audio you know through the way we did with Ben Pronsky now that I have that set up um, I can maybe talk to some of you guys and that maybe that's something we can work on in the future is like you know after I you know review a book or something maybe I can tap into one of you guys and you guys can call in and we can record the conversation and put it up as a like a podcast episode as well and that way we're getting more and more of your involvement and uh, and then other people's involvement and other people's point of views and not just mine you've heard my point of view on venom for 500 episodes now so it's time i think to evolve and start pulling in more people so we'll start that phase coming up pretty soon for sure uh, but i want to catch up i want to get a lot of content to you guys i got next week we're going to do uh for the first week of june we're going to do an eddie brock week because there's a bunch of 90s miniseries that we haven't covered yet like sign of the boss and uh, license to kill and tooth and claw and stuff like that and finale so i'm going to try to get as many of those as i can uh you know discussed and and you know record and everything and get those up to you guys next week and then also then a uh, the final part of that comes out this week in comic source it's kind of the first 
first major week of new comics from all the, you know, from two major companies, DC and Marvel. So I'll probably go out, pick that up, and then maybe next week we'll squeeze that into Eddie Brock week and talk about Venom Island as well. So there you go. Five minutes of catching you guys up. Now let's dive into this episode, this review for episode two of Maximum Venom. Uh, you know, I, this one at first I was kind of like, I got, I got a little disappointed at the beginning of this episode. So I'm sorry, Kevin and Doc and, you know, everyone who works on the show. I did get a little disappointed because what we saw was we you got this great video, Marvel HQ, which my next episode after this is going to talk a lot about Marvel HQ and some of the content over there called the Venom Files. So we'll talk about that in the next episode. But they have been putting up these cool things, you know, like, uh, you know, like how to speak like Venom, you know, a video with Ben Pronsky. We talked about that with his interview. Uh, and I'll talk about that more in the next episode. Uh, but they also put up this thing with Felicia Day, who I'm a huge fan of. And there was a chance I almost had to interview her one time. I was at Golden Apple Comics and she was there for a signing and I had a chance to interview her. And then her schedule got kind of changed around. And so she had to leave and I couldn't get the interview. So she was always like, you know, the, the person who got away that I've always wanted to interview because that was back when I was on the Nerd Nation podcast with my friend Jean. And I was like, oh, man, I would have loved to talk to Felicia. I'm such a big fan of hers. And obviously, as a Supernatural fan, you know, that made me even a bigger fan of hers because uh, that was m more exposure I got. Like, I watched her, um, you know, like kind of LARPing show that she did, uh, you know, The Guild. And I watched some of that, and I liked that. But I really liked her character, Charlie, in Supernatural. And that just, you know, made me a big fan of the character. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the actress, uh, Felicia. So, uh, so when I saw that they put out a video where she plays Mary Jane, I was all excited. So you can find that, and I'll have some footage here you can see. Uh, but I'll put a link to that down below and you guys can go watch that. And I was so pumped. I was like, dude, we're getting Mary Jane. This is going to be awesome. Uh, and then she pops up in the show. She's in the intro. And then that's it. <laughs> so when we when I first started watching the episode, I was like, okay, that's not going to be it. We'll still see her. We'll still see her. And then we got to the end of the episode and she never really came back in. And so I was bummed. Uh, maybe that's a good thing to build that anticipation. But it's like, at the same time, I was like, oh, this is Mary Jane. Like, I, I kind of wanted to see where this was going because I like the scene. It was kind of kind of silly, you know, and kind of goofy. Something like younger kids would definitely love. But it was, uh, you know, the story is basically Peter Parker, uh, you know, goes up to, he comes home from, you know, a night of patrolling or a day patrolling. And uh, he comes home to Aunt May. They're talking. He hears a bang upstairs. He goes up there and sees that Groot has somehow got into his room and uh, and has a tape that he needs to listen to that has a very important message from Star-Lord. So, of course, you know, he picks up the cassette and he's like, he does this thing where he's like, come on, man, these guys fly around in outer space and he's sending me a cassette? Like, what the heck? And he's like, that's so that's so weird. Like, you know, up your technology, dude. Uh, and then so he puts on the headset and he's hearing a message from Star-Lord and then the tape, cassette, you know, tape player uh, eats the tape and it like unspools out, you know, everything. And he's like, come on he's like come on technology like dude learn how to record things like with a hologram or something and uh, and i like that because that was a running joke throughout the whole episode where every time someone interacted with this uh you know little tape player uh they're like really <laughs> like isn't star lord like doesn't he have a spaceship and, and he's out in space somewhere so I, I love that that was kind of a running joke that they used two or three times in episodes it was, it, was, it was effective i liked it um because yeah it's one of those obvious questions where you're like why is he still rocking a tape player after all this time like i understand in the beginning he's connected to it but to send a distress signal to peter parker it seemed kind of silly uh but uh but you know he worked with what he have i guess but uh, so that was kind of fun so then he has groot now it's like you know baby groot essentially uh who he has to watch uh and and you know and he has to figure out all right we gotta let me see if i can translate your language let's bring you to like star labs or not star labs oh my god that's dc stuff uh, let me bring you to horizon labs and uh and maybe we can you know use something to decipher your language of course that doesn't work and then he has to go and meet other people and we'll get to them in a second but while groot's like causing a mess in his room Mary Jane is was invited over by Aunt May. So Aunt May knew Peter was coming home and she called her friend Anna Watson, you know, her neighbor was like, hey, I know your niece is in town. I'd really like her to meet my nephew. Maybe we could have her come over. So she comes over and then Peter comes down to meet her. And of course, instantly he's like attracted to her. He's like, oh, hello. And he's like, cheeks turn red. And then Groot swings by in the background and he's like, you know, and so he, it's kind of one of those like uh, 80s comedy moments or in maybe early 90s too, where there's like, you know, or an E.T. moment even where it's like, you got, oh, go, oh, go, don't look that way. And so he's like, hey, let's look at my baby pictures. And Aunt May's like, what? <laughs> and then Mary Jane's like, you know, she grabs the photo album. He's like, oh, look, there's me, you know, dro drooling. And <laughs> Aunt May is just like what is wrong with my nephew? Like, cause normally a parent will be like, Hey, let's watch, you know, let's look at baby photos or, you know, it, it's like a trope thing that you do in comedy sometimes. So to see it flipped and have Peter do it. And then Aunt May 
think and know it's a weird thing was awesome. But then, you know, Mary Jane actually found it endearing in a way. She was kind of like looking at the photos and she was like, huh, like she, you know, she could tell she was starting to like the oddness of Peter Parker. Like that, def, she was, he was definitely making an impression on her. And uh, I thought that was all kind of fun. Like, I don't know. I, it, it was, I was really locked into that. So when, when it had to get into the actual show, I was, I was bummed. I was like, I was like, I want to go back to that relationship that they're starting to build. Cause of what a, a completely unorthodox way for two people to meet and, and have an interaction on like a kind of a blind date setup type thing. I mean, of course the answer just trying to set them up as friends maybe, but, uh, but yeah, it was kind of funny. It was, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was kind of cute in a way and I, I dug it and it made me laugh. I was like, this is so strange. Like him showing her the baby pictures and stuff. So anyway, he was doing that to distract Aunt May and Mary Jane from noticing that Groot was around. And then he's like, Hey, you know what? Thanks for the trip down memory lane. I got to go, you know, I got to get to horizon labs. I got to go to work or whatever. And then he bolts and leaves Mary Jane and Aunt May on the couch, looking at baby photos of him. And, and then he goes out and grabs Groot. So I was like, okay. I mean, it, it was funny, but I, I wanted a little bit more of that later, but maybe that's just a testament to how well I thought they delivered that humor because it's silly humor, but I, I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was funny and effective. I thought it was really well done. And it was a, a neat way to introduce Mary Jane. That wasn't like something we've kind of seen before. I mean, it started out as something we've seen before and then it just took a weird left turn into odd behavior. And I was like, all right, I kind of dig that. And it works for Spider-Man because he's kind of a goofball, you know? So, um, so what he does, he has a, now he has Groot and he has to go figure out how to speak Groot, uh, because he needs that message translated. What did Star-Lord say? You know, what did he say on the tape? If I can't fix the tape, I need you to speak, and I need to learn how to speak your language, so let's go figure it out. They go to uh, Horizon Labs. Hopefully I didn't say Star Labs again uh, <laughs> before. Um, they go to Horizon Labs, and uh, he works with Miles Morales. They can't figure out what's going on. So then they decide, hey, what if we go see... Um, uh, you know, the Avengers, Tony Stark and stuff. And so when they go up to visit Avengers Tower, that's when they come across Ironheart, which is a character named Riri Williams, who I am very unfamiliar with. I actually never read any of the comics with her in it. And uh, and not, not for any particular reason. I just don't read Iron Man comics typically. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I also, I think I was introduced to her in one of the, uh, when I went to D23, they showed like a, a Marvel uh, cartoon with a bunch of female characters. It was like, Gwen Stacy, it was called Heroes Rising or something like that, or Battle of the Bands, I think. And it was like Gwen Stacy was like in a band and then she was like, her friends were Iron Heart and some other, uh, you know, like Avengers, like kid Avengers or teenager Avengers. So I was introduced to the character then and I, I didn't mind that version. I was like, oh, okay, that's she's kind of a cool character. In this one, I wasn't really digging on her at first. Like she was really arrogant. Um, she comes in and it's like, for someone who's like, oh, I'm an intern, and, and then she says she built her own suit. And I was just like, wow, that's a, that's a lot of setup like really quickly. <laughs> I don't know if they've established her before in this universe or not, uh, or maybe she's the same version of herself from um, the Gwen Stacy cartoon or something. I don't know, but uh, I was like, kind of at first, like I felt a little standoffish with that character. I was like, man, she's really, uh, she like, you know, taking the the thing, she's taking Groot from uh, Peter and she's like, I, oh, an alien, like, let's let's uh, dissect it and let's operate on it. And he's like, whoa, 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 he's like, it's a living thing. That's Groot, that's my friend, like, don't do that. And she's like, hey, you know, this is for science or whatever. And he's like, I don't care. Like, he's like, that's a living thing. So yeah, at first, I, and I know that was intentional that you're kind of supposed to, be like, whoa, what's her problem? She does explain it later. So I will say I came around to the character because later on she kind of explains her past and that she lost somebody. And because she admits that to Peter Parker, he opens up to her about his Uncle Ben and they, they, I think they understand each other at that moment. And I think that's the whole lesson here. And once I realized the point of this story, I started to give that a pass. I was like, okay, so that's her arc in this is that she's kind of starts off and she's very uh, kind of egotistical, but kind of a loner. And she likes doing things her way. And she built her own Iron Man suit because I guess she idolizes Iron Man. They never really talk about that. But because Iron Man doesn't really trust, uh, you know, some young kid who's smart enough to build Iron Man armor, he went off planet with the Avengers to help. They say they hint at that, you know, went out to fight something in space. So I'm guessing we're going to get, you know, some uh, some information there. They're going to they probably already dealing with the symbiotes. And there's some clues to that. And we'll talk about that in the next episode when we talk about the Venom files. Um, 
But so Iron Man and the Avengers are off planet. And obviously the Guardians of the Galaxy are as well. So we have Groot here on Earth and we have Riri kind of speaking for the Avengers. And she says, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, I have this AI in me called Not Tony, which I thought was kind of funny. So you can hear Tony Stark's voice, uh, but he's operating kind of her suit. So I guess he made some upgrades to the suit that she designed. Uh, so you know, she didn't build everything herself, but she built a lot of it and kind of got his attention, got an internship, and then now she's in this suit that's supervised by Tony because he doesn't want to just leave a kid in charge, uh, you know, uh, you know, without some kind of supervision. He created this AI called Not Tony that she has to have in her suit. So that led to some comedic moments. Uh, but once I saw the arc of this character was that she was standoffish and she was a loner and she was abrasive and she was a miss know-it-all to an extent, she warms up later to the team mentality with Spider-Man and uh, the totally awesome Hulk, uh, Amadeus Cho, uh, who also, I don't know too much about that character from the comics, so seeing him in this show was kind of neat, because again, I didn't really like him at first. He starts off, he's very uh, confident, cocky, smug, you know, he's kind of these things that I don't typically like too much in characters, but that's good. That's good writing, in my opinion. If you're if you have any kind of reaction to a character like that, that means they're doing their job because it's intentional. You the the writers and people want you to not like them at first. They want you to see their growth and that kind of thing, and they want you to think they're smug because they're writing them smug. And that's the thing is, I think a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't like this character because they're too this or too that. And it's like that's the point. So you stick with it, right? Like you stick with the story, and that's what I did in this episode. So as the story progressed. I, I liked it more and more and more, minus the Mary Jane stuff. I wanted more Mary Jane stuff, but hopefully we'll get that, you know, in future episodes because you got Felicia Day, like, you know, uh, you know, I'd love to see more of her in the show. And also that relationship between her and Peter, like, I'd like to see that build uh, and stuff. So, because I I'm, I root for Peter Parker, man. Like, I, I always saw myself as Peter Parker as a kid, and I, I root for him. When, when he is dating and stuff, I, I root for him. I'm like, I want it to work out. I know it won't because writers always change it up. But on a cartoon, you can have them, you know, commit to somebody. And same like in a movie. You can have them get married. You could, you could do things to them in movies and, and cartoons that you can't do to them in comic books because the comic books constantly reset themselves, and they don't allow for real growth sometimes for characters. And, and that's kind of a bummer. And that's the, kind of the, the soap opera of comic comic books and the bummer of comic books to an extent so I like when they interpret them in this way so when he's like when he met her I, I was like immediately that side of me came out I was like dude go for it and then he brings up the baby pictures and you're like all right don't go for it that way dude <laughs> uh, but uh but yeah so th this episode has it's about teamwork obviously and so when Peter Parker meets Riri uh they also go and she's like hey you know what since we can't crack this code she uses like you know uh, uh, stark tech and everything and they can't translate Groot's language so they go to dr strange and they ask him hey can you translate uh this language and then he's about to but then mordo shows up with aim soldiers and they send uh, dr strange and miles morales to a separate universe like an inverse uh, version of new york that's shrinking as the minutes go by uh, so it's basically a death trap for them so that was like really great because you got a team up of uh, you know, another loner, Dr. Strange, and who also doesn't have the patience for teenagers and stuff. And you have him sitting there with Miles and Miles like, hey, let me help you out. You know, I'm really smart with science and stuff. And Dr. Strange's like, no, you know, you're I'm sure you're a fine, smart kid, but like, shut up. Like, I I'm the adult here and I'm casting spells and I'm going to try to reverse this and everything. And Miles is like, yeah, but this place is shrinking. He's like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, the Daily Bugle shouldn't be that close to the Empire State Building. And he's like, what? And then he looks at it and he's like, and then he casts a spell and he goes, you're right, this place is sinking. He's like, see, I can be help. I can be of help. Like, let me help you. So it's the two of them, Miles and Doctor Strange, working together to escape this parallel universe. While in the real world, you know, Spider-Man is teaming up with Riri Williams because Groot has been kidnapped by Mordo and AIM. And then they're also teaming up, Mordo is teaming up with uh, Monica Rappaccini, who uh, is the scientist supreme uh, from the comic books. A uh, really obscure character, uh, but, uh, but a recent character too, I think created by Fred Vellente or something in... Uh, and one of the amazing fantasy reboots, I think, at some point. Uh, but anyway, uh, so Scientist uh, Supreme, she comes in, and she's working with Mordo. She's bringing the science angle. He's bringing the magic angle. They're trying to figure out uh, what Groot is. They want to uh, tap into him and create uh, Groot creatures uh, so they can control and use as like an army force, because I guess the AIM soldiers are idiots, so I guess that doesn't work. So they need stronger, you know, uh, creatures. So they create three evil Groot monsters, um, you know, to, to you know, carry out their bidding or something. And uh, and so, meanwhile, while that's going on, Spider-Man is teaming up with Riri Williams. They come to this island where AIM is because they triangulate where Groot, you know, they find a way to trace Groot. 
And when they get there, Totally Awesome Hulk is there. And so Amadeus Cho shows up. And like I said, he's this arrogant teen. He's He looks like the Hulk, you know, but he's got like spiky surfer dude hair. He's like, what's up, brah? You know, <laughs> and uh, he's got to have this attitude about him. And he was likable at first, you know, unlike Riri who came across standoffish. He's a little bit more likable. Like he has more fun personality, but you still are like, he's kind of a D-bag. You know, you're like, I don't know if I could trust this guy. And he says... You know, I showed up at uh, the Avengers Tower and I saw that you weren't there because I came to take over the shift because, you know, we're interns and we're supposed to each have our own, like, you know, couple hour shift, uh, you know, watching over the lab or whatever while the Avengers are away. And he goes, and I saw that you were gone. So I put, you know, I, I looked how, how to trace you through not Tony and I found you here on this island. So I'm here to, you know, I'm here to lead you guys. He's like, I'm the leader of the team. And, you know, Riri's like, no, I'm the leader of the team. And they're kind of fighting over that, and it causes a lot of, uh, you know, unnecessary stress on the mission and everything. And Spider-Man finally goes, look, everyone calm down. Like, I, you know, like, you, here are you, this is what you're good at, Riri. So here, I'm going to need you and not Tony to do this. And then you, totally Hulk, awesome Hulk, you know, Amadeus, you're really good at smashing things, right? And he goes, yeah, I am, bro. And he goes, great, so here's what I need you to do. And then they come up with these plans, and Peter Parker basically is showing that he's a leader, whether he knows it or not. Uh, and that's the point of this episode. That's when once I realized that, it everything fell into place. And I was like, oh, I see what they're doing here. Because this is, it felt, at first I was like, oh, is this filler? Like, because I want the sim, I want to see the symbiotes attack and I want to see that happen. And I want that battle to go on for like, you know, two, three episodes if possible. Like, I want to see a, you know, big you know, battle and stuff. And I want this to go on and feel, you know, I had all these like ideas, you know, we always talk about tempering expectations, but my mind was going a mile a minute of what they were going to do with the series. So I felt like a second episode that didn't involve symbiotes. I was like, oh man, am I going to be able to get through this? But I see why now that they did this because Peter Parker is going to need to lead against this army of symbiotes. He's going to have to because the other heroes are going to be taken over and it's going to come down to Peter Parker and possibly other characters. I mean, we saw on the promo art, we saw like Venom and stuff still too. So I'm hoping we still get something there. You know, I'm hoping something, you know, happens, uh, you know, and, and I want to see um, Peter step up and, and show people that he doesn't have to always lean on other people to do things. He can do things himself. And like I said, that's real growth for the character. And that stuff you can do a lot more in animation and movies and stuff. You can show that growth. Whereas the comics kind of, you can show it, but then you have to reset them, you know, and, and stuff. Or they or they feel like you need to reset them. I don't think you do. I think you can keep evolving the characters. Uh, but, uh, but in this, I, it, once I saw that, I was like, okay, that brought the whole episode together for me. Okay, he's the leader. And he's showing leader skills. And uh, and without like exposition or badly done, he's like through action. He's like, do, you know, you go do this, you go do this. And then in the battle, he's like, you know, teaming up with Riri and Totally Awesome Hulk. And they're taking down Aim and Mordo. And then meanwhile, Miles and Doctor Strange work it out to where they can get back to the real world. And they do. They create a portal. They come through. And right as the, you know, other New York is about to crush in on itself... And then what they do is they they trick the three Groots because uh, little Groot he's like in you know loves ice cream and that was a running gag throughout the whole episode is that he liked ice cream and every time he saw ice cream that he'd be like hey Groot go over there and, and get this you know secretly and don't let the aim guy see you and he's like okay and he, you know he's like I am Groot and he walks over and he sees ice cream and he goes ooh I am Groot and then he would just derail from the mission and get distracted and go eat ice cream so naturally when they when uh, these three dark versions of Groot were created from him. They came with the taste for ice cream. So Spider-Man's like, hey, Groot likes ice cream. Why don't we throw some ice cream through that portal and have the evil Groots go through? And then that, you know, that New York will collapse on itself and it'll take out those three uh, Groots because they were very powerful and the team wasn't able to physically defeat them. And so, uh, so they're like, that's a great idea. So they trick them into the portal, get rid of those three Groots, save little Groot, and stop Mordo and AIM and everyone at, at the same time, and also Scientist Supreme. Uh, so... That was fun. It was a fun episode. I really dug it. Uh, I had a lot of fun watching it. Like I said, the humor really worked for me. I like the setup of the ice cream and how that pays off at the end. I mean, these are things we talk about all the time in writing and, and balancing character and balancing story. But then also, if you're going to do something, uh, have it set up or have a meaning so that it, it pays off in the end somehow. And those are just all signs of standard good writing, in my opinion. Like, that's really solid stuff. It's good structure, you know, and you need good structure when you tell stories. So although I'm bummed that I didn't get a lot of Mary Jane in this episode, and at first I was bummed that I was going to get a filler episode, I felt like at the end I really got pulled back and was like, okay, my criticisms kind of died down because I was like, I see what you're doing here. 
you're showing Peter Parker become a leader because these other Hulk, like this Hulk, you know, and, and Riri and everyone, they're probably all going to get possessed by symbiotes and Spider-Man's going to seem like he's alone, but I'm hoping he'll still have a ragtag group of heroes that he can put together to stop this threat and then essentially be the leader of them. And so they kind of got that out of the way because, you know, you don't want some of that happening in the middle of that big fight where he's arguing leadership with somebody, you want to establish that now to show that he can do it. So that way, when the time comes, he will do it. Uh, so I dug it. I, I don't know. I thought this episode was fun and uh, I had a lot of great stuff in it. And I liked all the Mordo stuff. I liked the uh, the cassette, the running gag of the cassette because Miles was like, wait a minute, he put the special message on a cassette? That doesn't make any sense. And, uh, and Peter's like, yeah, tell me about it. And then like Doctor Strange, I think even was like, a cassette? Like, really? <laughs> so I loved all that. That was really fun. And then you had the message itself at the end they were able to um, you know, read Groot's mind and he was able to project images in their heads of what he saw in his last minutes. And what he saw was symbiotes attacking the Guardians of the Galaxy and, uh, and, and, and Star-Lord grabbed the cassette, recorded something on it, gave it to Groot and said, look, you gotta find Spider-Man. He's the only person on Earth that has dealt with these things and these things are coming for Earth. So you need to go warn him, you know, make sure you don't get distracted by anything. Go down to Earth and warn him and give him this cassette. And, uh, and it has everything I want to say on it. So they were able to get, you know, get the message uh, translated and sent, you know, sent to Peter, uh, you know, through his mind, I guess. And he's able to, you know, see that that's what's happening. It's symbiotes coming to Earth. So now they know symbiotes are coming to Earth and they know because there was that great shot. I thought it was awesome. It was all first person POV of Groot, like baby Groot being put in a capsule and then jettisoned out of the ship as symbiotes were, you know, swallowing uh, Star-Lord. It was awesome. I actually thought it was one of my favorite scenes in the show. And, uh, and so, you know, Groot, you know, head to Earth and, uh, and has that cassette. So I really, I dug that a lot. And there's some theory now I'm, th I'm worried about baby Groot if he actually got out of that ship without something attached to him, I don't know. I don't know because as we're going to see in the Venom Files, we'll talk about in the next episode, there's a hint there that maybe he could be a spy or maybe he'll be a spy in an upcoming episode. Maybe he hasn't been possessed yet. I don't know. But either way, uh, this episode ends with them uh, you know, realizing, okay, symbiotes are coming and it looks like they've already taken over some of the heroes. So we already have you know, uh, the deck stacked against us already. And that's them just knowing the Guardians have been taken over. They don't even know if the Avengers, who are out on a mission in space too, if they've been taken over. And I'm guessing they probably have already because as we'll see in the Venom Files the next episode, they already hint at who the first person possessed was. Uh, so we'll talk about that coming up. So yeah, have you seen episode two of Maximum Venom? It's it's fun. Hopefully you have, because if you wa watch this whole episode, I spoiled pretty much the entire thing. I mean, we did a full breakdown of this episode pretty much, um, but I, I just had so much to say. I mean, I, I really liked a lot of the scenes in this, and the reason I liked it more and talked about this more is because, uh, you know, because I started to, I wasn't sure about the episode when it started. Like the first half of the episode, I was like, ah, I don't know, I, is this filler? What's going on? But because the ending brought it home for me and made me relook at the episode in a totally different light and make me see what they were doing with it and what they were doing with the characters and why they brought in Riri and Totally Awesome Hulk and stuff to set Peter up, I was like, okay, I get it now. I totally get it now. Um, so yeah, so for that reason, I was like, yeah, I got a lot more to say because I was kind of negative at first and then it pulled me back in. So they pulled me back in. So yeah, anyway, let me know what you guys think of you know your thoughts of this episode down in the comments below. And in the next episode, like I said, we're going to go over some Venom files and some stuff that's on the Marvel HQ uh, you know, YouTube channel. And that'll kind of give us maybe a peek. I don't know how in continuity it is, but I imagine they wrote those things in mind of what happens in the show. So those are nice supplemental videos that I would recommend you guys watch. And we'll talk about those in the next episode. So make sure you head over to Marvel HQ, check out the six Venom files that are up now, and we'll discuss them in the next episode. And again, let me know your thoughts down below, or let me know your thoughts. I'm just now just rambling because it's the end. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below of this episode and uh and we'll get more episodes out to you guys very very soon i like i said i have more interviews i'm trying to lock down and work on for you guys uh, i have uh, some other comic book stuff we're going to do next week with eddie brock and then i might have a couple other videos i'll squeeze in this week as well so thank you so much as always like share subscribe all that fun stuff and i'll see you in the future peace